But here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, I mean the Prophet ﷺ, he adds to this, لا تنكح المرأة على عمتها وخالتها Do not marry a woman and her paternal or maternal aunt. That meaning, at the time I'm married to a woman, I'm not allowed to? I, I'm not allowed to marry her aunts. Yes. I'm sorry? Yeah, d during the time of marriage. So, so the thing is, like, there are some marriages that are conditional. So, so for example, when a man is married to a woman, he's not allowed to marry her sister, right? He can't marry her sister. And at the same time, he's also not allowed to marry her aunts. The moment he divorces her or she passes away, they're now eligible to be married. Either. I, either or, yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah, um, they're, so like they're basically they're like mahram, right? Yes. So, but not everybody's mahram. So, for example, my my sister-in-law, yeah. my sister-in-law, she's not mahram to me. Uh, okay. But I'm not also not allowed to uh, marry her. Um, yes. Mm -hmm. Now, would the, would the, the, the father-in-law still be, I guess... Oh, mahram? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he would. In every sense? Yeah. He would still, he would still be mahram to her. Oh. It's the same. Like, the same thing with... And the opposite would apply, too. Like, the son-in-law. The mother-in-law. Yeah. So, like, the mother-in-law, okay. and son, she, she would still be mahram to him. Okay. Right. The only time that doesn't apply is if they were, they were never intimate. If they were, okay. If they were right? Never right? If they never consummated, then no. But the moment they consummate, that's it. حُرِمَتْ عَلَيْكُمْ الْمَيْتَ وَالْدَمْ That you are forbidden to eat carrion and blood. And over here, Allah subhanahu the Prophet ﷺ, he says, أُحِلَّ لَنَا مَيْتَتَانِ وَالدَّمَانِ السَّمَكِ وَالْجَرَادِ وَالْكَبَدِ وَالْطَحَالِ That we have been permitted to eat two types of dead and two types of blood. Fish and locusts, liver and spleen. Why these, why these in specific? Because they have a lot of vessels. Right, so the spleen especially, like the spleen actually has a lot of blood. Uh, but the liver and the spleen, they have a lot of vessels in them as organs. So many times when they're removed, there's, a, there's still what? Blood. There's still blood in them, but the blood that stays... <laughs> it's, it's, it's okay. No, I just, I, I just started getting grossed out. So, so over here, this, it, uh, this, the blood that remains in those, it doesn't harm anything and it is permissible to, to consume. And over here, fish and locusts, when we say the two types of dead, because how do you define dead in Islam? Sure, that, yeah, you're, you're right, but in terms of consumption. No, the, okay, so anything that is not madhbuh, right? Anything that is not slaughtered is considered dead, whether it died from natural causes or unnatural ones. So, for example, if you have someone just comes and he just, just chops off the head of a sheep, can I eat it? Al khilaf, right? So <laughs> that's, a, that's, that's a bad example. Uh, but an animal, like an animal that gets hit hit by a car. No, no. no right? You you can't you can't eat that animal. You can't. I, I'm I'm assuming it's dead, right? So if a person who who hits an animal and the animal uh, dies in that way, all of those are not permissible. So there are two animals that it is. Some. Zakmah khair. So, fish and locusts. F fish. How do we? Uh, how do you slaughter fish? You don't slaughter. <laughs> right? You don't. You have to face the qibla. Face the qibla. Bismillah, Allah akbar. Why? Why do you guys think that is? How come I don't have to slaughter fish? Huh? Well, they don't breathe, right? That's, that, that's, oh, they don't bleed. Depending on the fish, right? There's some. Some have a little bit. Yeah. Some of them have open circulatory systems too. So, I mean, it really depends. But, Right, yeah, because they, uh, like, the moment I take a fish out of water, what happens? It suffocates, right? Like, you know, so basically, they're already dying, like, the moment I take that fish out of water. Like, I'm, I have, like, a lot of beautiful imagery today, right? So, like, <laughs> talking about, like, <laughs> talking about organs and fish, right? So, the fish, like, it dies automatically, it, and it's very difficult, right? Just imagine that the moment we had to fish, the moment I bring it in, I have to what? I have to cut it, right? I have to slaughter it. it and it's extremely difficult, it's extremely challenging. Like, locusts. Something. No, I don't need any sugar. Just like, look at. How do I? What do I do with locusts? You just crunch them. 
They make good tacos. <laughs> Has anybody had locusts? You guys know how to cook locusts, or how do you? You just cook it. Well, you can't you can't eat it raw, but usually I think they just like they'll put it on a stick and then like like marshmallows, you know. <laughs> uh, but the same thing, like so here the, by, by by extension by extension I can say this for anything that lives in the ocean. Um, and I could also say this for any type of insect, right? That these, these things specifically don't need to be slaughtered, right? I don't, I don't need to take a mealworm and say, Bismillah, right? You know, so th those things you can just consume. Any insects? Uh, just locusts? Yeah, so, I mean. What about the like, shark meat and all that? Oh, that's fine. I, I think there's, uh, so the, the Hanafis, they have problems with the, the bottom feeders. So like, like, like crustaceans. So you're talking about like like lobsters, yeah. So th those they have problems with. I'm sorry. Shellfish. Yeah, shellfish in general, uh, because, because again they say that they're they're, they're all bottom feeders and they're not they're not tayyib. Um, everybody else is okay with them. Yeah. Yes. I was I was surprised I had to say the same thing. So. No, no, you you you're good, man. You go ahead. Eat your eat your oyster. Sharks. Huh? Yeah, sharks. Are, sharks are fine too. Yeah. Well, they, they like the carnivores. Huh? Oh, well, yeah. Because they, they eat other fish. And and like and they're in the ocean. The the, the problem comes in and like. So you have like crocodiles that spend their time on land and in the water. Yeah. Uh, so, you can eat, so you can eat crabs and wasps, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, enjoy, man. Enjoy. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Except, it, uh, oysters are. I don't know. You guys have had oysters? Yeah. yeah. It's like it tastes. It's like really. Yeah. It's like it's like snot, man. Like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, put, I mean, I try. I tried it. I put. It's like this weird cold snot. You know. You know? <laughs> yeah. Tastes like? Really? Oh, what I end up? It's uh, it's like wrapped like grape leaves. The inside. No, 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 no. No, it does not. <laughs> yeah, that's actually. It does not taste like that. It has, it has, it has like a weird snotty texture. It's so, uh, it's so weird. But I mean, how do you love? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, so these are from an, and land animals, from land animals. So when, you, when you're talking about like cattle, and the reason they're, they're mentioned specifically is because of the amount of blood that's in those particular organs, um, which, which is really interesting, like the, the heart isn't included, because the heart actually doesn't have a lot of blood um, compa compared to these two, like it stays in the things. Yeah. You, you, you may want to give a context that blood in general is not lot, except for these two cases. Yeah, so... So the, here, the excess blood, because the thing is, blood, you have, in, in general, you have two types of blood, right? So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he talks about blood, he said, Adam al masfuh, which is the spilled blood, right? So, when the blood is spilled, all of this blood is haram, right? I can't, I can't take it like a cup and like, you know, and like, it's my usual, it's, it's not, so it's like, it's, it's not, it's not, huh? You know, the blood, blood just makes, uh, like, I have this thing, right? I don't know. Yeah, so the permissible blood is whatever blood is. It, it's, yeah, so whatever is still in the animal, it's actually permissible to consume. The only, the problem comes in with these two organs in particular because they actually hold more blood than muscle, they hold more blood than other organs, etc. So, so people, when they cut into this, like they're going to find, they're going to come, come across more blood than they would in other organs of the animal. So you gotta wait. No, 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 you can consume it. It's permissible to consume. So basically the Prophet he, here, he's actually giving a, um, he's giving an exception to that. Say, hey, let's, let the blood that's in there, don't worry, don't worry about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So because the thing is like even, um, like even, even steak cuts, like even steak cuts, when you take, the, what, what happens? Like you see, right, you see some blood. That, but but that, that small amount of blood is actually, is fine. It's not, it's not a big deal. Except if you're a Jew, like Jews actually have to salt their meat. So, so what they do is they'll they'll take the meat and they'll put it on salt to actually drain all of the blood out of it. Uh, can hadith abrogate the Quran? This is a theoretical argument. I don't, I don't, and there are no actual practical examples to this. Uh, some people they try to use like really specific examples, but it, it, it at the end it just really doesn't work. So over here, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. So for example, um, the prohibition of alcohol. Alcohol initially was, was it okay or not in Islam? Yeah, it, was okay. it was, okay. 
So eventually it became abrogated, but how did the abrogation come? Right, it came from the Quran. Right, it came in the Quran. The permission came in the Quran and the prohibition came in the Quran. So over here you have one verse abrogating another. Can the hadith now abrogate the Quran? This is the question. And like I said, this, this is a theoretical argument. There's no actual practical application to this. You don't, you don't have any instances of this. And even scholars, they would say, even theoretically, are not allowed. You know, it's, it's not something that would be allowed. But because we don't have any practical way of implementing this, it's, it's, a, it's a theoretical argument that the different fuqaha and the different jurists actually had. Any questions? I thought they, try, they try to use example of, uh, we'll see ya. But the, the thing is, it's like, it's, it's, that's more defining an absolute versus abrogating something. Because the we'll see ya, the, the bequest is still in place. It's not saying that, okay, bequests are not, you know, it's not, one isn't saying bequests are permissible, the other one's saying bequests aren't. It's just putting a limitation on who it can go to and how much it is. It's a defi like a definition more than it is a abrogation. Uh, so we're going to talk about, inshallah, the next section, which is what is really important is the historical development of the Hadith sciences. There are, main, there are five major time frames that are important to examine to help us understand this. Is during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu and the companions, uh, the time of the students of the companions, uh, who are known as the Tabi'een, uh, their students, Atba Tabi'een, then the golden age of the Sunnah, and then 5th century Hijri. And I will talk about why these are the five stages that are very important in helping us understand this. So the initial stages, this was the time of the Prophet Sallallahu This is the beginning of the science of Hadith, and which, which began with the actual beginning of Revelation. How so? So if the Prophet ﷺ, just imagine this, right? So the, com the community is small, it's in Mecca, and the Prophet ﷺ, if he would tell something to one companion, what would happen? He would tell to another one. Right, he would, they would tell each other, right? They would tell each other, well, I heard the Prophet ﷺ say this, or he did this, or he ordered this, or this was revealed today, right? So you, you already had that, these conversations happening, where they would actually relay information about the Prophet ﷺ like to, to each other. Yeah? the Prophet asked one of his friends to sit and... Yeah. Uh, and, and, they, and they would tell each other, and they would exchange. Absolutely, uh, and, and there we have many more examples of this, inshallah, that we'll we'll definitely get into. Uh, so the first science to appear related to hadith science is the science of narration itself, which we had talked about. The companions narrating to one another. Uh, the first narration that's recorded it comes by way of Khadija, radiAllahu anha, and her retelling of the coming of Jibril to the Prophet sallallahu at the cave of Hira with the beginning of Surah Iqra. So here, this situation that happened with the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The first person to receive it was, or the first person to deal with it was a Khadija radiallahu anha. And she went on and she told, and we have a very famous story. What did she do? She went to her uncle. She went to her uncle. She went to Walqab ibn Nawfal. She went to Walqab ibn Nawfal and she told him, like, hey, listen, this, is, this happened to my husband. And he said, okay, bring him. Let's talk to him. And he said, you're going to face a lot of hardship. You're going to face a lot of difficulty. The people are going to oppress you. And if, I, if I'm still living, I will stand. By you. I will stand by you. Uh, the, the companions, they were meticulous in taking note of everything the Prophet ﷺ did. They tried to spend as much time as they could. Uh, very famously in the Hadith of Umar an, with another companion, he said, listen, why don't we alternate days? I'm going to go to the market one day. You spend the entire day with the Prophet ﷺ, and we'll switch. We'll keep going back and forth and we'll inform each other of what we missed in that time frame. Uh, so they also understood their roles and responsibilities. Was every single companion a narrator? No, they weren't. All of them had different roles. All of them, um, all of them they, they supported each other in different ways. Right? Not everyone was a statesman. Not everyone was a soldier. Not everyone was a scholar. And they all had to complement each other in one way or another. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he sought to teach the companions a lesson uh, concerning narrations. And he says, What? Yaayu alladheena aminu in ja'akum fasiq bi nabain fatabayyinu an tusibu qawman bi jahala fatusbihu ala ma fa'altum nadimeen. That believers, if a troublemaker brings you news, check it first in case you, you wrong others unwittingly and later regret what you have done. So this is the first, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he's telling the companions here. And not, not, only, not only is he telling the companions, but this troublemaker himself is who? He's a companion. 
right? So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he's, he's talking to the companions and telling them from amongst them that this person who's coming to you with this piece of information himself is a, is a troublemaker. And here he's talking about a companion of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he's saying that, listen, if you get this piece of news, you now have the job to what? Confirm. Uh, to confirm it and to verify it. Make sure that this piece of news is correct. Uh, over here, now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ittalaqaw bi al-sinatikum taquluna bi afwahikum ma laysa lakum bihi ilm wa tahsibunahu hayyinaw wa huwa inda Allahi azim That when you took it up with your tongues and spoke with your mouths, things you did not know, you thought it was trivial, but to Allah it was very serious. Right, so these, this is very important because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, why is He talking to the companions like this? He's basically telling them that what? I'm sorry? You took responsibility. You have responsibility. That you have a huge responsibility in front of you. And what is that responsibility? To make sure what you're saying is true. To make sure what you're saying is true because you are going to be the people who? What? Oh, you're going to be the ones that carry the religion. You have this huge responsibility in front of you. And you are going to be the ones that carry the religion. And this is something the companions took to heart. It's something that they understood. Which is why not every single one of them narrated. Right, there was a select few of them that would narrate, they would corroborate, they would sit in the gatherings, right? they would do all those things, but not because of their huge responsibility that they knew they had, not everyone had to narrate. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, وَإِذْ جَاءَهُمْ أَمْرٌ مِّنَ الْأَمْنِ أَوْ الْخَوْفِ أَذُوعُ بِهِ وَلَوْ رَدُّهُ إِلَى الرَّسُولِ وَإِلَىٰ أُولِي الْأَمْرِ مِنْهُمْ لَا أَلَّا <coughs> لعلمه الذين يستنبطونه منهم ولولا فضل الله عليكم ورحمته لا لتبعتم الشيطان إلا قليل. That whenever news of any matter comes to them, whether concerning peace or war, they spread it about. If they referred it to the messenger and those in authority among them, those seeking its meaning would have found out from them. If it were not for Allah's bounty and mercy toward you, you had all you would almost all have followed the shaytan. Again, this idea of responsibility, this idea of a message, this idea of caring this forward and how they were responsible for it. Uh, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He admonishes, that, admonishes them and tells them like, listen, you need to be aware. You need to be careful of what you're saying. You need to be careful of what you're doing because you are going to be the ones that carry the religion forward. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he himself, he made efforts too in reminding them. And what are some of the things that he said? He says, Kafa bil mar an kulli ma sama. It is enough for a man to be considered a liar if he narrates everything he hears. And he's telling the companions this. And he also says in a very famous hadith, مَنْ حَدَّثَ عَنِّي حَدِيثًا وَهُوَ يَرَى أَنْهُ كَذِبْ فَهُوَ أَحَدُ الْكَاذِبَينَ That whoever knowingly narrates a lie on me is one of two liars. Either he himself is a liar or, or the one he is narrating from is a liar. So even here he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is reinforcing this idea of making sure that everything you say is true. Uh, so there are a number of unique elements to this era of narration. This idea of precision, this idea of religiosity, and, and, and it's important to understand that when we talk about adala, when we talk about trustworthiness, when we talk about religiosity, if a person is religious, how will that affect how precise he is? Yeah, right? if, he, if a person has taqwa of Allah, how much more so will he scrutinize his own narrations? Right? He's going to do it more. Why? Because not only does he feel it's a responsibility, he feels it's a... Uh, an obligation. He feels this is a religious responsibility that he has to make sure that he fulfills. Uh, so, there are a few things that I think it's important to understand. Memorization was a big part of Arab culture. It was a huge part of Arab culture. Why? Because they didn't have access to any writing or reading. Or not just that. So, the, the reading and writing tools were definitely limited. There's no doubt about that. But did the Arabs even want to read and write? Not really. It was Arab poems, but they actually would take pride in what? In their memory. They would say things like, I'll memorize a 4,000 line piece of poetry in one sitting. I just need to hear it once. And I'll, I'll, re I'll respond to you. This idea of having this photographic memory, of being proud of their memory, the, even their business transactions, even their business transactions, they wouldn't, they wouldn't write them down. Lineages. They wouldn't write them down. They would take pride in how they memorize all these things. So this, this idea of 
taking pride in this. They would use it as a means of storytelling. They would use it as a means of actually um, against their enemies. So whenever they wanted to spread news, what would they do? They would come up with poetry because poetry was the quickest way to get across Arabia. You would, have, you would have somebody memorize it, he would take it to another tribe, they would memorize it, they would take it forward. So this is how you actually gain notoriety. Notoriety was gained through this transmission of this poetry. So the more eloquent you were and the better versed you were, the easier it was to bring, tri bring pride to your tribe and to bring pride oftentimes to yourself. So this idea of, of culture having a role in precision is, is something that sometimes is difficult for us to relate to. But I, I just, I wanna use one example. And I, you, most of you guys are young. But before cell phones, before cell phones, and if I wanted to call somebody, what was, how would I call them? You had a notebook or you memorized. Right, I, either I had the f phone number memorized or I had, I had a notebook. Right, this is the only two ways. If I didn't have their number memorized and it wasn't in my notebook, they weren't getting a phone call, right? Like, I, I, didn't, I, didn't have, uh, you know, I didn't have it all saved on my cell phone. But why isn't it important today? Because the need is gone. So when you develop a need for something, some people are like, you know, how is it possible to memorize it? Because there's a need, right? When there's a cultural need and a cultural push for something, the other thing that we used to memorize that we no longer memorize today, directions, mm. right? If I need to get, if I need to get somewhere, I would either have to memorize the directions or I would have to, I would have to write them down. Like you guys, um, like I said, man, you guys are too young, but going to the nearest marker and then calling from a payphone, and they would come in their car and you would follow them to their house. Now, if I, get to some, if I need to go to somebody's house, what, what I, there's, there's two ways to do it. Either I can take their address or I'd be like, send me a pin, right? Because sometimes like it doesn't, the address doesn't show up. So these are all, again, when, when you have a cultural push to something, it becomes easier, easier to visualize why people acted in a certain way. So like I said, even in our culture, like even in our American culture, not that long ago, right? Like we're, we're talking about like maybe 25 years ago, maybe a little less, right? So it's not even that long ago. You're talking about like, you know, 20, 25 years ago where you had to memorize people's phone numbers or you had to write them down or you had to memorize directions. It's not strange to have an entire culture that didn't have books, Right, didn't really write, didn't really read. It wasn't like it wasn't a big thing to them. Even when Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, when he talks about Ummin, when he talks about those people who are unlettered, those people who don't know how to read and write, what is the opposite of that? Do you guys know? What is the opposite of Ummi in the Quran? Yeah, someone who doesn't know how to read and write. Uh, literate, sure. What what term does Allah use? Ahl Kitab. So even reading and writing, who do they ascribe it to? Because they, they used to read their scripture. And that was a big part of their tradition. So the people who used to actually read and write were who? Ahl Kitab, the Jews and the Christians. Meaning that the Arab themselves, they didn't view themselves as what? As Ahl Kitab. Like we, we, don't, we don't have a book. We don't read, we don't write. Like we, we don't even want to do that. That's not our thing. So, you know, again, it's important to understand some of the cultural context behind some of these things. Uh, during the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Umar went to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to ask him whether he had divorced his wives or not, to which he responded with no. Umar then asked him, can I inform the people the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam replied with yes, if you would like to. What does that tell us? This is... This, not, not very, well, this is verification because he had heard so he went to go verify from the Prophet ﷺ himself and then what did he do? Uh, right, not just an update he went and he said what? Permission. he got permission to what? inform this is, today we would call this what? Fuck. Fuck. No, uh, we, would call that, we would call it a blue check mark right? no, <laughs> this would be <laughs> this, is the, this is a hadith right, he's informing the companions about the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So when we talk about this idea of narration starting very early on, it started during the era of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Because there are a couple things here. Number one, he, he came to verify. The Prophet Sallallahu didn't ask him, say, what are you doing? None of your business. You don't need to know this. He came to verify. The Prophet Sallallahu he verified with him. And he told him what, what exactly happened. And he gave him permission to narrate. Showing that he Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam actually what? 
He trusted him. So this idea of trust was something that was established during the lifetime of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The Imam ibn Thalaba he came to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and asked him, Muhammad, one of your messengers came to us and claims that you claim that Allah sent you. Is that true? And he replied with yes. So again, this idea of confirmation, this idea of relaying information, it is not something that was strange at all. Uh, after his death, the Abu Musa al-Ashari, he came to a gathering companion and said, I beseech you by Allah, did the Prophet ﷺ say that seeking permission to enter a place or enter a home should be done three times. And if you do not receive permission, then leave. The story goes on to say that Umar, he told Abu Musa to find a companion of the Prophet ﷺ who would support his narration. So the, Umar was there and he heard Abu, Sa'id, uh, Abu Musa al-Ashari say this. And he said to him, he's like, you better go find someone to corroborate what you have to say. And if you don't find someone who's going to corroborate you, I'm going to, I'm going to flog you. So Ubay ibn Ka'b, so Abu Musa, he went to Ubay. He was like, he's like, yo, Umar is telling me I need to find someone to corroborate this hadith of the Prophet otherwise he's going to be. So what did Ubay do? Ubay, he sent, he sent a young companion. Why did he send a young companion? He to show that everybody knows. He's like, man, this is a hadith everybody knows. He's like, yeah, take this kid. He'll corroborate for you. So he sent this child with him, again, to show Umar radiallahu an, that this hadith is corroborated. And not just that, if this young sahabi knew this hadith, is there a chance, do you think that Umar knew it as well? Uh, no. think, I want you to think about that. Yeah, of course he knew. Of course he knew. Why did he do it then? He wants to show the uh, He wants to teach the people. Like when it comes to narrating the, message, the, the hadith of the Prophet sallam, don't play around. This is a very serious issue. This is a very serious affair. Um, so, inshallah, I want to talk more about the adala or the religiosity or the trustworthiness of the companions, inshallah, next time. And there's another issue that I want to spend some time on as well, which is the precision of the companions. So, the, as far as their religion is concerned, we have a number of ayat, right? And we have a number of ahadith, and we'll, we'll talk about some of them. But I want you guys to think about all right, well, if we said in hadith there are two conditions, right? That the adil and labit, that if they have to be trustworthy and precise, trustworthiness, would come, it comes from the Qur'an, very clearly. How do we know they were precise? And I want you guys to think about that, inshallah. I'll, I'll, see, uh, I'll see you guys next week, for those of you who are coming back for the hadith class. And then we have our tazkiyah class after Salat al-Isha. Salat al-Isha is, inshallah, in four minutes. Just want to give you guys some time to make wudu. Wallahu a'lam wa sallallahu ala khayri khalqin. Nabiya Muhammad wa ala alayhi wa sallam.